Hello, I am Kevin Jones, Fit and Museum Curator. Welcome to Creating the Costumes of Hamilton with costume designer Paul Taswell. We are thrilled to have you all join us. Uh, at the end of the evening, we will select a few questions from the audience. So be sure to drop your questions for Paul into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and not in the chat. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our esteemed guest. Paul Taswell has been designing costumes for Broadway, regional theater, film and television, dance and opera productions for close to 30 years. He began his Broadway career with a groundbreaking musical, Bring in the Noise, Bring in the Funk, and continued with the productions of Ain't Too Proud, The Color Purple, and A Streetcar Named Desire. Uh, most recently, Paul is known for his work uh, with both of Lin-Manuel Miranda's Tony Award-winning original Broadway productions, In the Heights and Hamilton. Paul's television and feature film credits include uh, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, starring Oprah Winfrey, The Wiz, and Jesus Christ Superstar, live in concert for NBC, along with Harriet, costumes we had now two years ago uh, in our annual Hollywood costume exhibition, and coming this December, West Side Story, directed by Steven Spielberg. In 2016, Paul received an Emmy Award for NBC's The Wiz Live, as well as a Tony Award for Hamilton. It was a good year. Another uh, notables include the two Lucille Lortel Awards, four Helen Hayes Awards, a Grace Princess Grace Foundation Fellowship, and the Princess Grace Statue Award. Paul holds uh, an MFA from New York University and a BFA from North Carolina School of the Arts. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome me in joining Paul Taswell. Hi, Kevin, how are Hello. you? Hello, how are you this evening? I'm great, it's so good to be here with everybody and everybody uh, that follows FITM. Thank you so much, and thank you for joining us all the way in Brooklyn uh, with me out here in Los Angeles and Absolutely. everybody around the world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have had so much interest in this. We literally have thousands of people joining us this evening, and uh, so we have a lot of questions to get through. And so I'm just going to start, and then we also have a great uh, Q&A at the end, hopefully, um, from our audience members, so they can they can uh, chime in and ask any of the questions that I don't cover. Um, so I'm just going to start. Please right. tell us all how you got started in the industry. Oh gosh, um, it goes all the way back to when I was in high school. Um, that was the the my the beginning of my interest in theater in general and specifically in costumes, but. Uh, I've, I've told the story and, and you know a huge number of times. Um, I used to want to be a, um, a performer. I was going to be a triple threat uh, performer uh, in musicals. And uh, I grew up in Akron, Ohio, uh, and I used to come to New York for school trips and uh, experience being in New York and seeing shows. Um, and then uh, ended up uh, going to North Carolina School of the Arts. Uh, I entered there to study costume design. Uh, there for three years because my first year was at Pratt Institute studying fashion and then I went to North I mean uh, New York University uh, to School of the Arts uh, again in costume design uh, to get my master's and I graduated in 89 uh, and started working soon after that um, largely at the arena stage in Washington DC uh, which is a, one of the major uh, regional theaters it's probably one of the first regional theaters uh, that uh, established itself uh, by Zelda Fitchhandler. Um, and uh, that was a, a wonderful place to find my, um, my design voice, I guess. Um, I had the opportunity to design a, a huge number of productions because I was the resident costume designer there um, and uh, worked a lot with uh, a director named Taswell Thompson, uh, who uh, is an amazing director and uh, he does a lot of uh, opera. He directs a lot of opera now. Um, but while I was there, I believe that George Wolfe saw my work there and uh, invited me up to uh, the uh, public theater where he was the artistic director. And uh, I was invited to do uh, first A Blade to the Heat. Uh, that was a, a new play. And then uh, he invited me to design Bring in the Noise, Bring in the Funk. 
uh, and that was uh, in 96. And, uh, and then I was uh, nominated for Tony, as you said, which was right. delightful. Um, but it, it also set a, you know, it, it set a tone or a standard that, you know, d didn't really revisit for, uh, for a while. Um, you know, it, it took me a, a, a number of years to then be invited again to design on Broadway. Um, but uh, I continue to design re for, for mostly for regional theaters all over the country um, and uh, have just continued to grow and, you know, to this day, I'm, you know, kind of do, doing the same kind of work. I uh, worked at Carnegie Mellon as a professor for three years, uh, and that was wonderful uh, to uh, nurture students and uh, to be a part of their mentorship and, uh, you know, get, getting them out into the world. Uh, that was great to nurture their, their creativity. Um, but uh, after three years, I decided that I wanted to go back to uh, freelance work and really focus on uh, doing that, uh, you know, my, my own uh, creative work and my own profession. What do you enjoy most about costume design, the production, the, the fittings, the breaking down the script or, you know, what, 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 what's the, 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 your, the thing that you look forward to the most, but also what do you like the least about it? Mm. Um, I would say, you know, uh, on a meta level, it's uh, the, the collaboration uh, because it, it, and it's, it's so broad. I mean, it's, it's collaborating with uh, the director and what their vision is for, for the piece. Uh, with the other designers on a production, uh, set designers, lighting designer, sound designer, um, the people that build the costumes that I design is is probably the the most gratifying uh, element. Um, and working with my team of assistants is is also gratifying. And then and you know it's it's me and the actor and uh, developing what that character is going to be, how to best realize. Uh, the character they're get, they're getting ready to play, so you know I think that that is you know if if, if there's one element that that would probably encompass, encompass all of it. Um, I also love working with fabric. I love uh, uh, drawing and painting and researching and you know just re recreating different kinds of of uh, worlds, different kinds of clothing. Uh, so that's definitely one of uh, well a, a group of my loves. Um, the, what do I, it, I, I would say probably my least favorite element is time management um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the scheduling and uh, I, I've been so fortunate to receive a lot of offers for productions uh, and, you know, offers for productions that I just don't have the time to, to incorporate into my schedule. Uh, so, you know, that, that can sometimes be, be disappointing. And, and then if I get myself into a situation where I'm juggling a number of productions, that's also, you know, kind of, uh, you know, it, it's, <laughs> it, yes. it becomes really challenging. So, you know, that's probably the, my least favorite element. I think all of us can um, understand that aspect of time management, juggling multiple projects, it's, you know, especially in, in today's world where uh, so much of it has to be done kind of remotely. Uh, and it's, it's learning a new way of, of working around schedules all the time. Um, yeah. So you fir first worked with uh, Mr. Miranda on In the Heights on Broadway. How did that collaboration first come about? Well, actually, um, I would say with both, my direct connection was with Thomas Kale, the director. Um, and uh, for In the Heights, I uh, heard from my, my late husband that it was happening. I actually wasn't aware that In the Heights was, was uh, you know, being developed. And, um, you know, so I pursued that, that production. I, I pursued uh, having a meeting with Tommy uh, you know, sitting down and, you know, expressing my interest and, uh, and then I was invited, uh, onto the production mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it was the, to, to be a part of that, uh, collaborative group, uh, was, you know, ha has been life-changing, uh, you know, since, uh, in the Heights, uh, and working with Lynn and working with, with Thomas Kale, 
Um, I, I had done a number of uh, other productions with, with uh, Thomas Gale. Uh, we did um, uh, Lombardi, uh, we did Magic Bird, uh, both of those productions on Broadway, some, some productions off Broadway as well, uh, regional productions. And then uh, Lynn, uh, we finished In the Heights and we went through the process of developing that. You know, so I was on, I mean, sorry, not In the Heights, uh, Hamilton. And I was on Hamilton uh, from the, you know, probably uh, the second uh, workshop, uh, which was uh, when they still had actors sitting at uh, chairs and, you know, in, in front of music stands, reading the script uh, and singing the music, you know, and they were still uh, trying to figure out how they wanted to, uh, you know, set this whole world. Uh, so I was brought in, David Corns was brought in, uh, Hal Binkley at the time was brought in. And, you know, we started to meet uh, design-wise about, you know, what, what would be the best uh, approach to, uh, you know, creating Hamilton. Even though they were, you know, the, all of the characters uh, were characters that historically existed. Uh, in one fashion or another, right? Um, but it, you know, we, we you know had multiple meetings, you know, just trying to figure out how how we were going to uh, present this because it was such an original uh, presentation of this story that uh, Lynn had put together. Now, had you been given the job, or were you uh, kind of auditioning? You know, how how is it that that you described? your vision for the costumes to Lynn and how did he describe his vision of the show to you? Well, um, it, when I was brought in for the workshop uh, process, uh, I was pretty much on, on board for, okay. pulled on board for, for the production. Um, soon after that first workshop, uh, the public theater kind of took, took the production under its wing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and that was with uh, Oscar, Oscar Eustace, uh, who is still the artistic director at, at the Public Theater in New York, um, you know, we, we kind of helmed that, that uh, element of the production, that part of the production. Uh, Jeffrey Seller is, is the, uh, the main producer, the main Broadway producer, and he was also one of the producers for In the Heights. Um, and uh, so there, I was a known factor Mm -hmm. uh, when I was asked to join the the group of of uh, designers for for uh, Hamilton, yeah, nice. Um, what is your research process like? You know, you, you, the the script's being broken down. Uh, you've had conversations. Mm -hmm. Now you're sitting at your desk and having to start, you know, pulling all of the elements together, starting to think about the the characters that in this instance, are real life historical figures, you know, um, because this, this production takes place from the late 18th century all the way through the early 19th century with several changes in silhouettes and styles. How is it that you go about your research process? Well, um, I just dive in. I mean, you know, I, I, the, with this production, what, you know, as, as we were saying there, you know, this, this was a known, you know, uh, a familiar period of time for in, in our history, you know, as far as mm -hmm. uh, we, we know, you know, what was going on with the American Revolution. We know uh, what year that was happening. We're, we have an idea as Americans who George, George Washington was and who Thomas Jefferson was and, uh, and even who Hamilton was. Um, you know, we, I, I grew to know him better because of Ron Chernow's novel, which is uh, the novel that, uh, the, the, or biography that um, uh, Lynn followed for the story and, you know, in developing the musical. Um, but, you know, it, because there was this modern element of music, the sound and the, uh, the text, uh, was all uh, coming from, you know, a, a very modern uh, voice mm -hmm. uh, of Lynn's. Um, you know, it, it brought up questions as to how do we best serve this up? And really, the, you know, it, it, it's, you know, to read it is, is one thing. You know, when I first received the script and, and I read through it, I was trying to make sense of the, you know, all, all of the, the rap, the patter, the, the 
poetry, everything that existed just within the words. And that was without the music. Right. And then I, you know, to then add the music to it as, as an element, it still doesn't get you there until you have the actors actually reading it or performing it, uh, even though they're not staged, but performing it in front of you. Um, when that happened, I absolutely fell in love with it. I was swept away by the, the emotion, the, uh, the heart that was, you know, is, is part of this story. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my relationship to it, uh, you know, it, it, uh, I, I had, I, well, I, you know, I already had respect for Lynn and, and the work that he did and his brilliance, but I, um, it, it was this, um, you know, overriding, uh, you know, thought that I didn't want to mess this, you know, wh whatever I was going to do design wise, I didn't want to mess up how we were going to serve this up. You know, I wanted to make sure that it was smart, that uh, it was to the point and very concise, uh, that there was no extra. Um, and, you know, it was really about, you know, throwing a, a, a lot of ideas out there, uh, putting them all into the bowl, and then being able to edit out what really wasn't pertinent to telling the story. And that was a, a process that all of us took part in. You know, that was a process that Lynn and Tommy and 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 David and and um, and and how you know we all were in there, um, really making you know trying to feel out what is the best choice for telling the story. Um, you know, so I put together you know it was a huge notebook of of research of images. Uh, both full of uh, 18th century uh, and and uh, early 19th century uh, images of actual clothing, of all of the paintings of, of the forefathers, uh, uh, you know, it, anything that referenced the 18th century, anything that referenced the, the American Revolution, you know, all the uniforms that might have existed. And then I, you know, was dipping into uh, you know, modern fashion designers and their, in, you know, the, those that had been influenced by the 18th century. So what their kind of uh, modern uh, lens would be on the 18th century. Um, you know, having done In the Heights and working with uh, Andy Blankenbuehler uh, and his choreography, I was very familiar with how he was going to use bodies in space, how he was gonna move bodies through space and how athletic they would need to be. Uh, and I realized that, you know, they could be in, uh, he could choose to use sneakers and jeans and, you know, that, that, that would be the way that he would want for them to move. Uh, because if you're dancing in a pair of sneakers, it's gonna, you know, it, it, it allows you to move in a certain way, but it also forces you to move in a certain way as opposed to if you're gonna be in a pair of hard sole shoes. So, um, uh, you know, I, I thought, well, we need to figure out how we can get the cast to relate to, if we're gonna use the 18th century, how to relate to those clothes in the same way that they would, re would relate to sneakers and jeans and t-shirts. So that there was, you know, it was kind of uh, second nature that they get up in, in the morning, they put on these clothes, they put on, you know, shirts that have uh, the, you know, uh, long, you know, ruffled cuffs with lace on the edge and, you know, that, that all of these elements feel uh, as part of their normal life as they could possibly uh, be. So that, you know, that was later down the road. What we ended up doing after that, that, uh, that second workshop, um, we decided uh, once we were in with the public that we were going to do a staged reading that we would actually dress, that I would costume uh, for the presentation of the, of the workshop. Uh, and because we were with the public, I was able to use uh, the stock that they have and because they, you know, they, they had years and years of uh, Shakespeare's that they had done. And, you know, so they, they have this huge stock room that, uh, that I was able to pull from and put together a look that would just hold together as design. It wasn't, you know, it was more function than it was about creating this, you know, necessarily this world. I just wanted, was trying to get everyone into 18th century clothes and pulling all of these old boots that had been worn <laughs> in the park 
you know, it, it was, you know, that I, I um, you know, I'm so thankful to all of the cast uh, at that time because they were willing to, uh, you know, be really game about, you know, going down this road. So um, we I think it's them. interesting to to hear about that process, and I'd actually never heard of a, a designer being able to kind of have a um, a tryout with just other costumes as what will work, what yeah. could work, what doesn't work, what feels yeah. like if you're living in the 18th century, normal to you, as, as you mentioned, like jeans and sneakers here. I, I, and I, right. I, when I'm watching the production, I, I think it was incredible because, you know, the 18th century in the Regency area was very, very fancy. There was lots and lots and lots of stuff going on mm -hmm. with the clothes, but to take it just to that strong silhouette yeah. and clear colors and, and a lot of color blocking, especially with the uniforms, Right. And with so much movement going on with the dancers and with the actors, if it had been too detailed, so much would, be, would have gotten lost or, or blurred away. Um, so I, I think what you were able to do was just incredible because yeah. you can concentrate on the, the era because of your strong silhouette, but dive into that music and that story that is being told to you without yeah. much distraction. That's spot on. I mean, that's exactly what uh, I was attempting to do and, and realized that that was the best way to, uh, to support uh, this story. Because, it, you know, I, I, you know I, I felt like you can establish a silhouette and, uh, and buy into it as an audience and then not really think about it anymore, which it then allowed for you to just engage with the text. And I mean, because there's so much coming at you yes. throughout the evening. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, it was important to not to have it not be about all of the all of the stuff, all of all of the, you know, the the treacle that, you know, could glom onto an 18th century gown. And I I personally love that. You know, I, I yeah. love period detail, but, uh, I, you know, it, it was an important uh, element to, you know, really strip away and did, and just go for the essential. Uh, and uh, and and then allow for the the story to come to life, you know, with and and really focus on their faces, uh, their you know their their beautiful voices, just you know everything that they were about. And I love to hear uh, when you know artists such as yourself uh, look to other artists, and and because we all can can be influenced and uh, by, by people who have come before us or people that we're working with. And, and like you say, the collaborative aspect of, of teamwork is, is just to me the best also. And you know, I, I love that, I, I read that, that you were, have been influenced by other designers who also love the 18th century and have interpreted it themselves, such as John Galliano, Alexander McQueen, but also in portraitists like you know, Kehinde Wiley, and yeah. um, who has really brought that aspect of grand 18th century portraits, which is what we see, you know, when you do the research for Washington and Hamilton and Jefferson and our, our, our founding fathers for the, for the United States. And, he, you know, here he is bringing this, this tradition in such a grand new way um, for today's audience. And I just see that being reflected in what you have done for the Hamilton costumes and all of those historical figures. Thanks. Um, you know, it, we're in this time, you know, through, you know, the, the, the last year and a half uh, and before that, but, you know, just re really pulling forward and, and pulling into focus um, how uh, black faces, faces of color, uh, have been uh, reduced or pushed aside. You know, where, when you think about the 18th century, you think about white faces. You rarely think about black faces. And there, there, there is so much research that is, is bubbling up to the surface mm -hmm. of pe you know, people of color within the 18th century. They were there, we were there. We were, you know, we, we, you know, we were a part of the story. Uh, and I think that that's what Hamilton actually speaks to. Is that you know whether the you know the you know knowing that no Thomas Jefferson was not a, a, a black man in the 18th century, 
but they, there was a black, you know, there, there were black people in that period dressed in those clothes and living those 18th century lives. Right. And, uh, you know, it, it, it is a, it is a part of the American story. And I think that that's what we were all about is, you know, that's, that's what Lynn was, was about in telling the story of Hamilton, that it is, you know, this is an American experience and it also is inclusive of, uh, of, of all people. Can you tell us a little bit about your color choices for each of the characters, such as Hamilton and Jefferson and the Schuyler sisters? How is it that you came about um, and, and morph those colors according to what was going on in the storyline? Sure. Um, you know, it, it came out of, you know, very organically uh, where we start is in this very neutral palette. You know, everyone is in this, in shades of cream uh, and tan. Um, and it's what we, you know, term now as our parchment look. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it, it became reflective of, um, and this is, you know, it, when it was established was actually that, that first stage reading, but that was done again because of function, because that's what we had a lot of in stock and that was a way of holding the, the visual together. Um, but you know, as it developed, and once we were, you know, actually creating for the public stage, um, it it be, became a place to start. And then, as characters are revealed, as as specific characters uh, come to life, basically, then they don their own color palette. They, you know, they have something that is that that we are then able to follow as as their story. Um, you know, the, um, Burr, Burr starts in his raisin coat and he is never in parchment um, because he's set up, set up as the narrator. Mm -hmm. um, but then you've got Hamilton that puts on, the first thing that he puts on is his suede uh, coat, 18th century coat uh, from the island. Um, and, you know, it's kind of broken down. It's, it's it, you know, it's ruddy. It's, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a worker coat. Um, and then, you know, it, his story continues, you know, the, he, he goes into uh, his officer uniform and then he goes into uh, his politician green. Um, for the, uh, you know, the, the sisters, for the, the Schuyler sisters, those colors, um, you know, it, it started, it, it was it, trying to balance the three sisters together. Right. So that they hold um, space, or they, you know, they 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 are visually present uh, and individual in their color palette, uh, but neither of them kind of takes, uh, you know, takes precedent. Let's say, mm -hmm. and there, the the thing about uh, Angelica, I always, you know, felt like she was uh, almost like the sun. I mean, that she was very, you know, iridescent, and uh, because she's a socialite, she. Uh, she sparkles. She's, you know, she's full of life and and warmth. Uh, and those are, you know, the the way that I choose color. It tends to be very uh, personal and, and visceral. It's a personal personal reaction to uh, the character and how I see the character. Um, so I, I gravitated to a lot of uh, actually the, the Skyler sister uh, taffeta, you know, silk taffeta. It's, it's kind of a frosted, uh, we, we call it a frosted strawberry. It's, you know, it's got this pink, but then, you know, it, it tends to a gold as well. Um, for Eliza, uh, because I knew that she was going to have a lot of scenes with, with Hamilton, uh, I was keeping her uh, cooler. And there was something that was so sobering about, about that. I mean, that, you know, she's very um, uh, forthright, uh, solid, um, strong. Uh, and 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 intelligent as well, uh, but in a different way than Angelica. Um, and then with um, uh, with Peggy, it was you know one it was that okay now I need another uh, type of color that will, again will will hold and you know and not wanting to go to a pink or you know or or any other you know kind of blue tone. I decided to go with you know this kind of golden tone. Uh, saffrons and you know uh, you know again to uh, to keep her you know effervescent and you know uh, and, and 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 with each of the colors I think that they 
reflect, you know, skin tone, and uh, you know, they 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 feel very appropriate appropriate to their characters. They just seem like the three graces to me as I watch them, you know, dance throughout the the whole of the show. It's just amazing because they, even though they get separated out, you know, they they still feel like this cohesive unit. Sure, sure. Uh, so, but there is one costume that does stand out quite a bit. It is quite fussy. It's quite regal. It's got a lot of bling going on. Uh, and that's King yeah. George, uh, Great Britain, you know, whose yeah. costume is much more period authentic. Um, I know exactly the portrait that you were looking at um, yeah. in your research. Uh, but can you tell us why, you, what, what the choice was? for that character and specifically that he is the only actor uh, on the stage wearing one of those powdered 18th century wigs. Yeah. It was very important. I mean, you, you, when you think about uh, Hamilton, you think about uh, Eliza Angelica, Th Thomas Jefferson. I mean, these were young upstarts. You know, right. they, they were revolutionaries, you know, youthful. Uh, full, full of vim and vigor, and and taking over uh, their colonies, you know, and uh, so you know, I th I think that it was important to then uh, create contrast with their oppressor, you know, and with King George, he's completely, you know, he's heavily laden in the ermine and you know the big velvet cape and all of the trim and you know having everything. Uh, the crown, I mean, the, the original crown <laughs> was uh, huge, hugely, uh, you know, wa weighted uh, because it was, it was actually metal. Um, now we, you know, we are, are able to use, use a, a combination of products, but um, it, you know, overall, it's to give this sense of being stuck uh, in history uh, and, and, you know, and, and not wanting to give up. You know, so that that was you know really the uh, the you know the the, the main drive be behind his character. It's great, and he just stands out because he just comes on stage, and you're like, oh, here's the king again, yeah. you know, to lecture us. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, it was it's fantastic. It's just so great. Um, so um, the you you mentioned this a little earlier, and I'd love for you to be able to elaborate a little. And I love that. That, that idea of parchment being used as kind of like the blank slate of our country. And these, these guys, the, the, the Schuyler sisters, they're really writing this new world on this blank parchment. And, you know, that you created this, this kind of new, the new corsetry and breeches and riding boots for the, the Hamilton dancers. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Certainly, I mean, it, you know, it, did go back to, you know, that I was talking about the idea of sneakers and jeans and t-shirts, mm -hmm. you know, and trying to, you know, once we made the decision that it, it was uh, best to go after an 18th century silhouette, overall an 18th century silhouette, we, we did want for the company to feel still modern. I mean, we wanted for it to still feel like it was a modern expression. Um, and so I, I thought, okay, well, I'm going to take elements of 18th century clothing and put it together in a way that feels more, that feels more modern, you know, so with, uh, and also it needed to function in a way that they could move in the athletic way that uh, Andy was asking for them to move. Um, you know, the, the, the boots, the, the riding boots or, or soldier's boots, uh, were given because all the men were going to play uh, soldiers and all of the women were going to play soldiers. Um, the, the riding breeches would, you know, it gave, you know, I could do them in a ponte, I could do them in a stretch where they could move as easily as they, you know, might possibly move. So they, they were in breeches and that was an 18th century silhouette. Mm -hmm. When it came to their torsos, um, we decided that it was, you know, both sexy and also felt very, uh, you know, a modern take to have them be shirtless, the men, and just have the, the waistcoats and then uh, stocks uh, to finish out that, that silhouette. For the women, again, going back to, the, you know, how it needed to function, once the show starts, 
it's nonstop. It's you know right. literally nonstop. And you know, so they're becoming men. They're 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 becoming women. Going to the ball, they then you know become men again. You know, it's so it uh, they they needed to have uh, their upper portion be flexible. Be uh, you know they, that it could change. Um, and I decided that I was going to take the corset, which you know, it has become a very contemporary right. element, but then uh, render it in a period way, you know? So I was referencing actual 18th century corsets and the, the detail on those corsets so that, it, you know, we were still looking at something that felt connected to the period, like all of that, the, the, the ribbon detail or uh, banding and piping, uh, that's, you know, that's all referencing actual 18th century corsets, but we've, you know, rigged it up in the back so that it can flex and, you know, do everything that it needs to do uh, as they're moving around. I mean, sometimes they actually have them on underneath their waistcoats uh, when they're playing soldiers. So, you know, it, it, it definitely needed to uh, move with their body in a way that you wouldn't, you know, normally for, for an 18th century, 18th century corset. But when they're in the corset and then the, you know, the, the, the stretch pants uh, and the boots, that creates a very sexy, you know, contemporary uh, silhouette. Uh, and so it, it, it was always kind of pushing and pulling uh, with, uh, with, with the ensemble, you know, that you kind of felt, oh, you know, I, I, I could see myself walking around in that outfit on the street. Uh, and uh, it's also very 18th century as well. Yeah, it, it really accentuated the beautiful dancer's bodies, but at mm -hmm. the same time, yes, still kept evoking the period uh, that, that you were dealing with. And I, I love the, the, the guys in, in the waistcoats with the stocks, but without the, the blousey shirt underneath. I thought that was really yeah. fantastic. And I'm sure those guys thought it was fantastic as well because they sure. could just move every single direction. And the, right, the women's right. corsets really remind me, we have a few um, late 80s, early 90s, Vivian Westwood, corset in the museum's yeah. collection here, which, um, you know, are based on 18th century prototypes, but totally made out of stretch materials. Mm -hmm. And it just, mm -hmm. it, it just had this wonderful synchronicity when I was looking at it, because then I get to see all of that brought to life, um, yeah. you know, in, in movement. Um, and speaking of the textiles, because it's going to be a one important, especially for a dancer to be able to move and stretch and do all the things that are required for those athletics. Where, how do you go about choosing your textiles? Um, uh, again, some of it is function. You know, I was talking about the, you know, the the ponte uh, that we use. Like, you know, it's it's what you would use for riding pants for you know contemporary uh, riding clothes. Um, you know, that we, we've got stretch all throughout. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, contemporary clothes that you, you know, get off the rack, but then also within this production, you know, I'm very grateful that we, we, we can dip into that. Um, but then, you know, there, there were other uh, types of fabric that I really wanted to have be part of the, uh, the, the visual. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of satin, uh, silk satin, uh, that's iridescent. Actually, we were looking at uh, an iridescent coat that uh, Jefferson wears. Um, it's it's shot with uh, green. There, it, it used to be shot with you know the, because you know the, you you also have to deal with you know sometimes fabric runs out, and you you can you have to re swatch or you know buy, buy other pieces. But originally it was shot with kind of a silver tone. Uh, now it's shot with a, a bit of green. It's kind of an acid green, but it still uh, reads as this you know kind of. Uh, plummy, um, you know, uh, you know, fuchsia. Um, and uh, so there, there was that kind of fabric that I wanted to use uh, on some of the principles and velvets. And, you know, so because I was limiting myself to the silhouette and to simple detail, uh, I wanted fabrics that would be crisp and sculptural and hold shape um, and catch light in a beautiful mm -hmm. way. Um, the, uh, the, the other thing that I wanted to use, and this is you know, tapping into my love of dance and movement and fabric in movement, 
uh, was using taffeta, using you know that crisp, light silk taffeta that m most of them are iridescent in the, in the production, um, but it catches the air in a way mm -hmm. that no other fabric does. Um, and uh, pairing that with petticoats that are made out of their, their nylon organza. And they, you know, so th everything is always kind of very buoyant uh, and light. And their, and their panniers are also made of uh, rows and rows of, of nylon uh, tulle. So that keeps, you know, their, their, uh, their, their pannier, their, you know, their, their, their bustle, basically, um, uh, you know, it, it keeps it light as well so that when they're moving, there's no, you know, there's just no weight. I mean, it's just no, you know, it, it, it's always swirling. Um, and, you know, the, I, I, don't, I don't know if, if everyone is, is aware of it, but we're also on a turntable. So that accentuates yeah. how bodies move in space on the stage. Uh, and when, you know, when the women are swirling around and being lifted and, you know, it's, it, it all becomes a really beautiful picture. And so it was, you know, again, it was something that was developed over time, you know, where you could see how people, how Andy was having people move and then you, how you saw how the stage was going to move. And then for me, it was like, okay, well, this is really, the best choice for kind of you know making the most out of this uh, this uh, this moment. The uh, interesting uh, some comments I, I heard you make uh, previously was about your research for period style. It was kind of four tenets that you followed: research for period style, whatever that's going to be, the comfort of your actors. The functional aspect of quick change, because there is a lot of clothing coming and going in, in, in this production. And then also the overall visuals for your audience. And I also love this quote by you, if I may, <laughs> that costumes shouldn't go away, but they should get out of the way so that, that the audience can be in the moment and experience the world that is in front of them. And I think that is, that is um, that's amazing. I've never actually heard another designer say that because most of the times designers <laughs> want their costumes to be seen. That's the point, right? Yeah. Whereas that's completely kind of the opposite. It's like, no, 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 no. What's going on in the story and what are you learning? Um, and the costumes go along with it, but it is, it's the center characters that you need to concentrate on. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, you know, I really hold by that. Um, I think that it makes me a better costume designer if I play along with uh, what, what the performance is, what the, you know, the, the, uh, the actor is bringing to the event, what, you know, how the director wants for the, the story to evolve. And if it is a costume moment, you know, if it is a moment that is all about, um, you know, a runway show, then that's a different kind, you know, that, that's, mm -hmm. you know, costumes front and center. But, um, you know, really it, 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 uh, otherwise, you know, it is, you know, setting up uh, the visual and then you know, letting it recede so that you're really seeing the, the performance. You know? um, one of the things that, that allows for that to happen, I think in a beautiful way, and, and uh, we made that choice very early on, is to, you know, you, you pointed out that King George is really the only one that uh, is, is wigged in a, you know, in, in a powdered wig. You know, actually there are many more, if you come to see the show now, there are many more people that actually have wigs on than you, you might recognize, but they're all designed to be reflective of who the actor is, uh, what the actor brings to visually to the event, uh, to the, the production. Um, and then we've, you know, we've created styles that uh, stay, can stay consistent from production to production as an idea. They will sh shift and change depending on who's playing the role but the overall essence of an Eliza, the overall essence of Angelica, the overall essence of uh, Mariah's, it, you know, it, they, they stay pretty much the same. We're going after the same idea as a character, but it's reflective of the, the uh, actor that's actually playing the role. So 
you have designed for stage, film, television. You the your 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 film uh, costumes coming out from West Side Story this December with Steven Spielberg. Do you do you like stage best? Do you like TV costume film? You know, is there is there one? Are they the same? Are they are they incredibly different? Um, which do you prefer? I love design overall. I mean, I I I, I don't know that I uh, have a preference. Um, I I'm, I'm most familiar with. Uh, with, with uh, live performance design, because that's what, I mean, I've, be, I've been doing this all, almost th 30 years. Mm -hmm. So it's probably a good, a good 20 to 20, well, maybe 22 of, of that was, was all devoted to live stage performance. Uh, then I started to dip into uh, film and television. Um, and I've grown to love film and television and what that process is. It's a different, you have to shift your brain in, uh, how, you know, really how you hold it in your brain and what's coming up because scenes are shot out of order. Um, you know, with, with live performance, you are able to see the whole presentation in one sitting. Uh, you know, you eventually are able to, you know, see everything you've done how you've told that whole story in, in the two hours of a musical, let's say. Um, for film, you don't really know how it's all going to line up. You, can, you have to imagine it uh, as you're going forward. Um, and that's, uh, that's a challenge, I mean, it's tricky. Um, but I, I absolutely love it. I mean, it's, you know, I, I've had, you know, I've been so fortunate to have the opportunity to design so many different types of live performance productions that now to have the opportunity to design film and, you know, especially with West Side Story, which, you know, it, it was my first production that I was ever connected to when I was in high school, then, you know, it's, it, it's uh, you know, it's an amazing kind of full circle. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so I, I, I'm, I'm just thrilled to be able to shift into that world as well. How was it working with Steven Spielberg? It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. That's great. Uh, well, I would yeah. like to open up the conversation now to uh, our viewers. And we've had a lot of uh, questions come in. Uh, so I'm going to anticipate one. Uh, you know, you have also been a costume design instructor for many years. What advice would you give your students about how they need to prepare, what the industry is like, you know? Um, I know those are big, broad, sweeping questions, but uh, you know, what's what's your personal advice? The industry is, you know, it, it uh, it's it's ever changing, but I think that we're in a place right now that it's there's a huge shift in how we're doing uh, productions. I mean, we're I'm uh, in in the middle of designing a, 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 an opera for the Met, uh, and Wonderful. it's called Fire Shut Up in My Bones, and uh, that you know. The way that we, you know, have to, you know, honor you know, the protocol for, you know, for COVID, and you know, it's just the process of uh, keeping everyone safe has added time to, uh, you know, our, our mm. schedule. You know, so it makes it more challenging. Right. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, definitely it's the same for film and television. It really just is about, you know, keeping everyone as healthy as possible. Um, and you know the, how, how you try clothes on, and you know, and and doing returns, and you know, it's it's all kind of made the our process um, uh, more challenging. Um, you know, I think you know you, you, the first part of what you were asking, you know, as far as you know, young people coming out uh, or you know, starting to design, I think that uh, it's developing a passion. Some part of it that you're really passionate about because it, it the, the profession can be grueling, um, you know, it, as, and it, you know, it was when I first started out as well. Um, I, you know, it, I think that it's very important to know what you want to have an idea, a vision of where you want to go, whether that's going to be television and film or, or just television or just film or Broadway or regional theater. 
um, and to then know what part of that you want to embrace, you know, how you want to be a designer. Uh, and some of that is, you know, takes a lot of introspection and, and, and trying to figure mm -hmm. out what are, what are you good at? Um, but I think that, you know, whatever that is, figure out what, what you need to know in order to succeed, which in wh whichever direction that you're going to go. Uh, for me, I developed, uh, you know, my drawing and painting skills and my uh, draping skills. Uh, and then, you know, as I matured, you know, how I communicate uh, with directors that was developed as well, you know, how I engage with actors, how I engage with those people that are building the costumes. Um, you know, that, that was not something that I just, you know, I came out of uh, graduate school and knew exactly what that process was. Um, but, you know, I, th I think that it's very important to be sensitive uh, always, uh, you know, when, when you're communicating and, you know, and, and, and then, you know, have, having your, you know, it's, you're, you, you have to check your ego a bit so that you can stay open and stay flexible uh, and uh, know what the priority is in creating, specifically creating theater. Definitely, you know, with, with film as well, you know, understanding what your role is in, in, in that uh, machine. One question that's come in from Sherbet is, uh, this is practical, do you use historical pattern cutting techniques or do you adapt contemporary methods to create historical costumes? Um, it depends. Um, oftentimes uh, that the, the historical, you know, historically accurate pattern uh, might be a place to start. Um, you know, because, you know, say if I was going to design um, a cavalier dress, you, 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 I, I know that the arms I need to sit very close together in the back. So that there's, uh, it, you know, so that the, uh, the span across the back is fairly small. So, you know, that's just talking about something that's very specific, but it's, you know, it, you, you still are dressing a modern body and, you know, our, our bodies are, are you know, they're even different than they were in the 1970s. I mean, you might come across somebody who has a 1970s body, but most of our bodies are very athletic. Uh, and, you know, how we live in clothes is very different. So when you're trying to recreate a period, let's say, you want to tap into those, uh, uh, you know, th th those elements that, that might, you know, kind of move you a little deeper into the period. Uh, mm -hmm. So as a designer, I'm always looking for those places where I can accentuate some of that uh, because, you, you know, because I always know that you're, you know, it's always going to be built by somebody who's, who is, you know, modern uh, and it's always going to be worn by somebody that's modern as well. Pat B asks, what fabric looks fabulous in person, but terrible on stage? Have you come across any that you're like, I'm never going to use that fabric <laughs> ever again? <laughs> um, there, there are fabrics that are, they just don't hold up. Um, you know, there, there's this beautiful iridescent chiffon, silk chiffon, it comes in beautiful colors. It's very magical when you're like, you know, moving it around. But the only thing that it's good for, is, in, my, in my opinion, is making a scarf. Um, because it just doesn't hold, it, it runs very, very easily. It, it, it snags and catches. So it just doesn't look good for any longer than coming off of the, you know, the, the cutting table. Um, there's also this, there, it, it, there's a fabric called crepeline. I don't know if it, it's still mm -hmm. called crepeline, but it was a very, very, very thin organza, silk organza. Again, beautiful uh, to wave around and catch the air and, you know, and be magical but it just doesn't last. And when you're, you know, you're talking about Broadway costumes that need to go through eight performances a week um, and, you know, hopefully last for at least six months you know, or longer, uh, it's just, you know, it, it, it's just not a go-to. Svetlana had a question that, is something I thought about when I was watching the, the film. And, uh, you know, these actors are moving and dancing and performing live under hot lighting. How do, they keep cool and then maintain their ability to move around. I just thought, how are they not sweating out these costumes right before us? 
they are <laughs> smacking <laughs> out the costumes right before us. Um, yeah, it's uh, you know the you you know you it's right there. I mean you, you know the the uh, ensemble is completely they're athletes and they have uh, two sets of uh, the same costume that they go through every every performance. So they they change okay. their their costume uh, mid you know midway at the intermission. Um, there aren't two of the you know like the silk dresses. There you know they, there there's only one of those. But those those pieces that they're in for most of the evening, we have multiples of those. And then you know many of them go into a washing machine and they hang up and dry. Right. Um, you know, we, with, with uh, Scotty Westervelt, we, you know, we've developed ways of maintaining the clothes so that it preserves uh, the look of the clothes uh, best. Yeah. Alexandra asks, have there ever been any ideas, I'm assuming for Hamilton, let's stick to Hamilton, that you've loved that didn't end up working out? Um... I mean, I tried everything, you know, when, when we were at the public, I tried hats, I tried, you know, I tried all kinds of 18th century elements that we just, it just wasn't right for this production. You know, Jefferson was in a brown velvet suit with a, you know, a burgundy waistcoat originally. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, you know, uh, there's a, a Vogue shoot that was done and you can see, you know, the, the original costumes. Uh, of the of the principles, and uh, we sh we shifted that as an idea. We should, you know, uh, Tommy came to me and said, you know, I think that you know, with the way that David is playing this role, we want to shift it uh, to a more flamboyant uh, rock star kind of guy. Right. Um, and it, you know, I, th I think that it made you know a huge amount of difference in how we uh, how we respond to Thomas Jefferson. Definitely, definitely. So you know, I think that you. You know, that, that, that is another place where you, you say, okay, well, I'm going to throw this out there because it makes sense to me as a moment, but it might just might not, you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't land or, it does, you know, it doesn't uh, live with the rest of the world that you've created. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I'm so grateful with this, you know, again, I go back to, you know, these collaborators you know, that we were in a safe space to be able to try things out uh, and still, you know, walk away feeling respected for, you know, trying out those, those ideas. Um, I think that it's important to develop collabor collaborative uh, relationships that, you know, you feel respected, you feel um, uh, that, you know, ideas are honored. Um, and then, you know, there's trust, you know, and, and uh, that's where you do your best work. Or that's where I do my best work, definitely. Well, I uh, thank you for being so honest and forthcoming um, with, with so many answers for, from me, but also from our, our viewers. Um, there, there is one question that just I love because um, it, it hits where I work, which is the museum field. And this is going to be our last question for the evening. Uh, it's from Renee. Have any of the original cast costumes been preserved for the future uh, in a museum? Do you know? Um, yeah, well, uh, at the Smithsonian, we have Lynn's original uh, green suit. That's great. Uh, so uh, he's he, the, the suit, not Lynn, but the, the, <laughs> the, 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 his suit is, is sitting right next to one of the original Kermits. So it's, it's been a, an, an honored place, yeah, 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 yeah. And then on the other side should be one of the original George Washington. <laughs> right, 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 definitely, definitely. No, I, I was able to see it a couple of years ago before the pandemic, I was able to go down and see it. But that's, you know, I was uh, very pleased, very pleased. Well, I'm sorry that we couldn't get to more questions from our viewers. I, time flies when you're having fun. And I swear, I feel like I've been talking to you for maybe 10 minutes uh, uh, and yet a whole hour has gone by. So I just wanna say a big thank you to Paul Taswell for being with us this evening, for sharing so many fascinating insights about your work on Hamilton and your upcoming projects and for being such an inspiration to the next generation of costume designers. 
we hope to welcome you. Please come and visit us and your costumes Absolutely. in person at the Fitty Museum. We're hoping, we're, our galleries are closed right now due to the pandemic, but we are hoping to open them up uh, in the early part of next year. And we would love to have you come out and visit anytime you're in Los Angeles, please stop by. I would love to shake your hand because I have just um, loved what you've done for Hamilton and for Harriet. We, I, it was really, I got to dress those for the exhibition and that was, that was quite a privilege. So thank you for that. And you have just been a, a fantastic um, font of knowledge tonight. Well, thank you so much. And Kevin, it's been, been delightful to spend the evening with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, you are all invited to join us for um, upcoming FITM virtual open house, which will be on July 31st. So go to FITM.edu, F-I-D-M.edu to register or to see the RSVP link that is in the chat. Um, uh, you are uh, invited also to follow us on Instagram, not only the FITM Museum, so at FITM Museum, F I D M. M-U-S-E-U-M, two M's in the middle, and also uh, at Paul Taswell, at P-A-U-L-T-A-Z-E-W-E-L-L. -L. Thank you all for joining us tonight, and good night.